So first, I will start my the uh, acknowledgement because all the research I'm gonna present today is uh, just one part of uh, a larger project that uh, we had many collaborators uh, working on from MIT, from Grenoble in France, uh, and different uh, um, industrial co companies uh, working with uh, data from uh, the Groningen uh, uh, experiment. And so we uh, we submitted. Uh, four different papers uh, doing imaging and monitoring and developing new methodology to, uh, to monitor uh, velocity variation using uh, noise correlation. So yeah, there is a huge bunch of people there, uh, partly from MIT. So the outline of my talk would be uh, to start uh, introducing what is uh, environmental seismology, what I, I call environmental seismology, using ambient noise correlation and the uh, limitation of uh, the existing method to uh, monitor the, the velocity change in the ground. So I will show you uh, the, uh, the data and the array experiment that I, I will use, uh, and I will spend a lot of time uh, describing all the methods that we developed during this, uh, this project. And I will, I will show you the results and the interpretation, hydrological interpretation in, in the end. But first, what, what is seismic noise? You, uh, you know me, you, uh, you heard uh, a lot of uh, uh, the term seismic noise. So basically, when you uh, install seismometers anywhere on Earth, you will record a lot of things, mainly uh, uh, earthquakes, but also uh, um, tiny vibrations that are always there, uh, all the time, uh, day and night, and uh, uh, that can be recorded uh, everywhere on Earth. And that's, uh, so this is what we call seismic noise. This is the persistent uh, ground motion uh, in absence of earthquakes. This is mainly composed of surface waves, uh, so really waves, low waves, uh, and it's generated by uh, the swell and uh, the wave in the ocean, mainly, uh, depending on the frequency. If you look uh, at this noise in the time domain, it's, it's pretty random, it's, uh, it doesn't have a, a clear structure, but if you look at that in a, in a frequency domain, you see that uh, you will have a, a main uh, peak in the frequency around one to uh, ten periods, uh, uh, ten seconds of period, with a smaller peak at longer period, and this is the what we uh, what we use and what we call seismic noise. This is the read the uh, interaction of the uh, the wave in the ocean uh, creating uh, pressure forces on the seafloor, and these pressure forces will generate seismic waves that will travel uh, uh, across the earth. So. How do we use the seismic noise to uh, do environmental seismology? So first, the first application is really uh, studying the uh, environmental phenomena uh, via their uh, seismic signature. So I have two, uh, two examples here. Uh, one from uh, or glaciology, where uh, when you listen to the seismic noise in Greenland, depending on the, on the time of the year, uh, you see that you have a, a large correlation between the amplitude of the seismic noise in red here and the uh, concentration of sea ice in the ocean. Because sea ice covers, covers the ocean, it prevents the wave uh, in the ocean from interacting, and so you completely damp the, the seismic noise close to the station. So this is a, a neat uh, uh, application, and you can really monitor the, the density of sea ice and the, uh, close to the stations uh, around Greenland and, and Antarctica using this, uh, this kind of techniques. Another application, uh, by Lucia Gualteri. I think she's visiting next week uh, Harvard. She's giving the BICEP seminar and speaking about this study, uh, I guess. So if you want to, to know more, just wait for next week. But basically what she showed that uh, it's uh, tropical storms in the Pacific Oceans, in the uh, western part of the Pacific Oceans. Uh, all the different storms during one year, 2012. And this is the uh, spectrogram of the seismic noise recorded at one station in, in Taiwan. And what she, she shows that is that the, the seismic noise amplitude or strength uh, very closely follow the strength uh, of the each hurricane. Like that's the, the color that we have along the tracks. And that's the black line here. Uh, it's the impact, uh, uh, the intensity of the, the hurricanes. And we see that the, the seismic noise amplitude and strength is, is strongly correlated with the strength of, uh, of, of the, um, the tropical seasons. So it's pretty nice, but uh, mm -hmm. why do we do that? It's because if you want to, uh, uh, to know the, the strength of cyclone, usually you have to use satellite data. But if you want to go back uh, in time, uh, 
uh, go at the beginning of the 20th century where satellites were not existing, but seismometers were, you can still track uh, tropical cyclones back in time and uh, assess their uh, variation uh, along, the, along the different uh, centuries and see uh, the impact on the uh, uh, due to global warming. So second family of application of environmental seismology is studying the impact of environmental forcings on the solid earth using seismic observations. One of the first examples was done actually here at MIT by uh, uh, Riesenberg and, and Aki in the 70s. Uh, they went to a quarry in uh, northern Massachusetts and for two days they, uh, they shot a uh, hair gun every 10 seconds uh, and they, they measure at a nearby station the travel time of this wave uh, every, uh, every hour by stacking all the and what they, what they saw is that this travel time uh, is actually changing by a uh, uh, very small amount, some, uh, some milliseconds, but it's very closely uh, uh, correlated to the, uh, the tides, the strain uh, induced uh, uh, by the tide on the, on the solid earth. Same study has been repeated still at MIT by uh, Shushan Mao uh, on a volcano, where uh, she uh, basically did the same, uh, the same experiment for a longer period of time using uh, uh, seismic noise, not active, active sources. This is the spectrum of, uh, of the time variation that she's observing, where you see different peaks in the spectrum that are aligned with the, the peaks in the spectrum for the, the tides, the tides model, but also for the temperature model. If you look closely, all the, the peaks are not exactly aligned with, uh, uh, with the time, but some are more aligned with the, the temperature. So the, the modulation that we see in the seismic wave variation is a combination of both uh, tid tidal strains and temperature strains on the, on the solid earth. Other examples, uh, this one is very, uh, very impressive and very neat. Uh, 30, day, uh, 30 years of, of uh, continuous seismic records. And uh, in black is the, the, velos the speed of the, the, the seismic waves uh, a long time for the 30 years. And we see in, uh, in red is the record of the temperature, or uh, actually the, tra the translation of the thermoelastic stress on the, on the crust, but basically it's uh, the increase of temperature for the, last, the past uh, 30 years, which is uh, closely correlated to uh, uh, the, uh, the velocity variation in the ground. So you can monitor global warming more or less using uh, looking at the speed of seismic waves. Another very impressive study uh, done by uh, uh, Tim Clements and, uh, and Marine Donnell in Harvard uh, was to uh, monitor uh, groundwater uh, in an aquifer in California. And you see that uh, the black curve is the seismic velocity variation, and the blue curve is the uh, water level in, uh, uh, in this aquifer. And you see also the uh, very, very nice correlation between the two. Uh, so you can really use uh, seismic information to, to monitor what's happening in the, in the crust due to environmental forcing. So how do we do that? So basically there is a, a theorem that tells you that if you record seismic noise at two stations, uh, you have uh, seismic noise recorded, and you do a cross correlation of these signals, you obtain a, a function that looks like that. Uh, it's a cross correlation function. And that's closely related to the grids function or the impulse response of the ground uh, between the two, uh, the two stations, as if one station was uh, an impulsive source recorded by the second, uh, the second station. Because we are using seismic noise that's available all the time, we can repeat this, uh, this procedure uh, whenever we want, and we can uh, build a series of, uh, of uh, cross correlation function as a function of the calendar time and see uh, all uh, they are varying in time. And this is how you, uh, you, do, you obtain those uh, uh, nice results that I showed you before with the variations. So exactly how do we do that? So we compute the cross correlation at one period of time. There is a change happening in the medium, uh, velocity change due to uh, uh, hydrological forcings or uh, uh, tidal forcings. And so you recompute a cross correlation a second time after the change, and you will uh, compare the two waveforms. So what we do usually, it's uh, compare the waveform 
in the very late part of, uh, of the waveform. Because if you have a homogeneous change in the medium, um, the deformation <coughs> of the, the waveform after the change will be just a stretching or compression of, of this waveform. And it's going to be a linear, uh, increasingly, uh, uh, increasing linearly with the, the lifetime in the correlation. So it's much easier to measure this lifetime in the very late coda than in uh, direct, direct uh, uh, ballistic waves. And also, coda waves are just the wave scattered and traveling all over the place in, uh, in the medium. Uh, so they are not sensitive to um, the noise sources distribution. Because if you come back to this example, if you have a homogeneous uh, distribution of noise sources, you obtain perfectly symmetrical and, uh, and, uh, uh, and true Green's function. But if you start to have uh, noise sources that change in time as well, uh, at the same time as the medium is changing, you will also induce some, uh, some variation, some deformation of the waveforms. And so you will maybe uh, mistaken the, those variations that you are measuring as a change in a medium. Actually, it would be a change in the source of noise around the, around the stations. So these coda that are traveling everywhere in the medium and bouncing from, uh, from place to place, they kind of forget the signature of the noise sources, so they are less sensitive to the, uh, the noise sources variation. But the ballistic waves, the direct waves between the two stations are quite sensitive to these uh, uh, noise sources variations. And so what we are looking at is uh, the relative velocity variation, so the delta V over V, uh, which, uh, uh, if the change is homogeneous, will be uh, just the linear regression of the little travel time, the little time delay that we can measure all along the, the time uh, uh, of the correlation. And uh, this relative velocity change is just the opposite of uh, this, uh, this, uh, time uh, this regression. <coughs> so, but there are limitations yeah, in doing this, uh, in using this method is that we don't really know what, uh, what uh, are the nature, what is the nature of the wave uh, arriving late in the coda. There are a mixture of uh, body wave, P wave, S waves, and surface waves. And we don't know really the, the proportion of them. Uh, we don't know if it's only a fundamental mode surface wave or, or different other tones. So it's a mixture of every, uh, everything. And so we don't really know uh, physically what's, uh, what's uh, in this, uh, in this uh, disposes uh, late arrival and so uh, also it's pretty hard to use them to locate a change because the, um, the wave is traveling also bouncing all over the place kind of randomly depending on the scattering property of the, of the crust and so you, uh, you lose track of the, the path, the actual path uh, between uh, uh, station A and station B. And so you can still compute a kind of sensitivity uh, of uh, change in the medium to uh, uh, for a certain arrival in, uh, in the coda. And this is the, the sensitive kernel, how it looks like. Basically, it's the probability of a path to go from, from the point e to, uh, A to, to point B. So it's very high near the station because the wave has to start and arrive at the two stations. So you, you have a maximum near the stations. It's quite high, high in the direct path. But you still have some probability to bounce here uh, several times before going to, uh, to B. So uh, you have very smooth and very wide uh, sensitivity. So you can't really locate precisely where the change is happening. <coughs> you assume a surface wave or a body wave? What's the uh, here for this kernel, it's uh, assuming a surface wave. Okay. But you have, a, if you introduce even the mixture of surface wave and body wave, it's even more complicated to have. A, here it's just a lateral uh, sensitivity, but you also have the sensitivity at depth that's changing depending on the nature of the, the wave. So that's a mess. And so <coughs> if, you, uh, if you really want to, uh, to locate a change in a medium using coda wave, you have to have strong assumption on, on the nature of the wave, uh, on the type of the wave, on the type of the scattering in the crust, uh, that's some, uh, some uh, information that we usually don't, don't really know well. So it really limits our, our ability to resolve uh, laterally, the change in the, in the medium, and also at depth. And most of the talk that I, I will show you later is how to solve uh, this uh, depth resolution problem. So the uh, main idea is to use ballistic waves instead of coda waves, so the direct waves. 
because we know physically how they are propagating, like the P wave, S wave, and surface wave. We have a, a very good physical understanding and, and, uh, of their propagation, and so we can really uh, see if if they are changing, where the change is happening, because we know their path. But there are some limitations also uh, in using uh, the ballistic wave, is that they are less sensitive to a small change in the medium, so you have to have a, a velocity variation rel relatively high compared to what you can measure with scalar waves. And you, uh, you need to also to mitigate this uh, noise sources variation uh, uh, problem because they, are, uh, they, they can be a, a huge bias in your, uh, in your method. So let's dive into the, the data that we are using to, to solve this problem. Uh, it's a nodal, so we are using data from uh, one month of record of a, a nodal array. Uh, installed above the Groningen gas field in, uh, in the Netherlands. So here is the outline of the Groningen gas field. It's the, the largest uh, gas field in Europe. Uh, it's producing a lot and creating a, a high uh, seismicity rate with magnitude up to uh, 3.6. And so recently, uh, the companies uh, uh, managing the, the gas field wanted to, uh, uh, to have a, a better understanding on the, of the very near surface to. Uh, uh, to, um, to mitigate the, the seismic hazard for, for the people living, uh, living in this area. So they deployed this kind of uh, US area type of, uh, of uh, network all over the place. Here it's, uh, for example, to, uh, to do imaging, uh, passive imaging of, uh, of the very near surface. Uh, so this is uh, an example of uh, uh, the background a seismic velocity model at uh, 60 meters below the surface. And for four different patches, uh, the ambient noise tomography uh, that we uh, performed uh, to compare with uh, the, the background seismicity model, uh, seismic model. And see, we have a, a pretty good uh, uh, correspondence with, between uh, uh, active seismic and, and passive seismic, where we see the paleo channels pretty, uh, pretty clearly. So this is the uh, array and the data that uh, we use. One month of, uh, of continuous record for 400 uh, stations, separated by around, the, around uh, 300 meters on an 8 by 8 square. This is a, a beamforming analysis of the, the noise uh, recorded during this month. So we have a main uh, energy of the noise coming from, from the, the North Sea, actually, in this direction. And, but we see that we still have some energy coming from uh, uh, more than 80, uh, 180 degrees around the stations. So basically, it's coming from the whole uh, shore of, uh, uh, of the Netherlands. <coughs> Here we have a, a spectrogram of the noise during the whole months, uh, with the uh, period increasing and the time. And we see that uh, for the um, a period of uh, one, uh, one second, we have this natural noise coming from the, from the oceans. And for a period below uh, one second, we have this uh, daily pattern that indicates that this noise is mainly uh, due to uh, human activities, where we have a lower energy during the, during the night and higher energy during the day. We use the, this, this whole uh, noise to, uh, to compute the, the correlations. So we compute the correlation between every pair of stations so we have more than uh, 80,000 uh, 80, correlations uh, possible. And this is a, a stack or a section of all the different uh, correlations uh, sorted by distance and stacked together. If you have a correlation, whatever is a location in the array, uh, that has a distance, interstation distance of, uh, of let's say, two, uh, two kilometers, we stack all those correlations together and we bin them uh, along the distance to increase the signal to those ratio uh, and to uh, also kill this uh, uh, azimuthal dependence on the, on the noise sources. When you're stacking and averaging uh, over all the azimuths, uh, you will decrease a lot this uh, uh, noise sources variations uh, a long time. So what we see, that we, uh, we have the whole family of, uh, of uh, different waves. We have a uh, high frequency uh, uh, wave that are, are traveling uh, quite fast, they are P waves. Yeah, it's a, a zoom on a filter section. So we have a direct P wave uh, traveling in the medium, and we start to see also a refracted P wave. Yeah. And we have also a surface wave uh, with two branches of surface wave. So we have the fundamental mode of the surface wave and the first overtone of, of the surface of the Rayleigh wave. So 
to understand a bit better uh, why do we see those, uh, those waves, uh, just look into the velocity model. So this is the velocity model obtained by uh, uh, active seismic experiment. And this is the, the corresponding model uh, done by uh, ambient noise tomography for the similar region, but they are not exactly uh, aligned. Uh, and uh, that is a 1D profile uh, across the model with the comparison uh, in red with uh, a log data, uh, in black is this uh, IT seismic model, and in uh, green is uh, this uh, passive seismic model. So we um, did some tests, and actually we saw that the, uh, the direct wave, the direct P wave, is actually traveling uh, in the very near surface, around the 200 meter depths, and uh, the refracted P wave that we are observing is actually refracted at this interface between the uh, Cretaceous uh, sediments and tertiary sediments and traveling uh, across the, the network. So how do we use those waves to do, uh, do monitoring right now? <coughs> so the, the main idea is to uh, not uh, do the monitoring along the time directly in the, in along the coda, but in the 2D space uh, time versus uh, distance. If we uh, look uh, closely at the equation, if we have a, uh, a wave traveling in the medium uh, before a change and the same wave traveling in the medium after a change, we see that along the distance, uh, the time delay induced by the change will increase linearly with the distance. And uh, this linear regression of the time delay uh, between the two waves, so this is uh, shown here, uh, is actually the variation of the slowness. Uh, the slowness before the change and the slowness uh, after the change. We know that uh, uh, the relative slowness variation is just the uh, opposite of the relative uh, velocity variation. So to obtain a, a relative velocity variation, we just have to uh, multiply uh, this linear regression of the, the time shift versus the distance by the uh, opposite of the, the phase velocity of the phase that we are, we are looking at. So this is, uh, this is true for any ballistic wave that we uh, can uh, uh, identify. So it's pretty easy for P wave or uh, refracted P wave. This is true also for body uh, for surface wave, but we have to be <coughs> careful because for surface wave, which are uh, dispersive, so that uh, this delta T will be frequency dependent. We have also to uh, use a frequency dependent velocity. And so the problem will be to how do we measure this uh, frequency dependent uh, delta t? But first, the results uh, of the P wave monitoring. So, this is uh, an example on the refracted P wave where we have uh, um, the reference seismic station, uh, seismic section, which is just the stack of the 10 first days of the, of the month. That would be our, our reference. And this is uh, uh, another section, the current section the stack of uh, the day number 7 to, uh, to 16. So they are pretty similar, but the signal-to-noise ratio is, uh, uh, is pretty low. And when we uh, measure the, the time difference, the time shift between the, those waves along the distance, it's those uh, dots that we are measuring. It's pretty noisy, but we can still perform a linear regression in that, and we have a, a, a negative slope in this, uh, uh, in this example. And if we repeat that for every day in the uh, in the months, we, uh, we can see that uh, we obtain a, a variation, a relative variation of, of P wave, of the refractive P wave, that goes from, uh, from zero at the beginning of the, uh, the months because it's for reference, that increased by 1.5%, more or less, uh, after 10 days, and that slowly decreased afterward. So we have a lot of scatter because the signal to know is, uh, is pretty low, but we, uh, we still see some variation. If we repeat that on, on the P wave, we see that the change are, are different. We only have a decrease of velocity, but a much smaller one. Here it's, I don't know if you can read it, but it's minus 0.25% compared to 1.5%. 1, 1 so this is an information. We, uh, we know that during this, uh, this month of record, we, uh, uh, we had the refracted P wave at the base of, uh, of the tertiary sediment that uh, increased a lot and slowly decreased and the direct P wave traveling in the very near surface that decreased uh, uh, slightly. So let's see what, uh, what happened with the surface waves. 
So surface wave, we have a, a, a problem, an extra problem here is that we have two modes. Uh, we have the fundamental mode and the first order tone. And before measuring the travel time uh, delay between uh, uh, day one and day two, we have to separate those modes because they are not traveling in the same, uh, uh, at the same depth in the medium, and so they are not sensitive to the potentially to the same changes. So if we don't want to mix up the, the measurements and the, uh, the value of the, their travel time, we need to separate those modes beforehand. So it's done with uh, just the FK filter, uh, where we see the, the result of the, for the fundamental mode and for the, the first of our tone separated. And now we uh, are using exactly the same, uh, uh, the same formula, so the, the phase velocity, the relative phase velocity variation as function of the frequency is equal to uh, the opposite of the phase velocity uh, dispersion curve that we can measure directly on the F FK spectrum uh, times the, uh, um, uh, the linear regression of the frequency dependent travel time uh, be uh, time shift between uh, uh, D1 and D2 uh, and the regression is done between uh, Different, uh, two different distances. So the question is, how do we get this uh, delta t, a frequency dependent delta t? And so it's where we uh, introduce the cross wavelength transform. Uh, it's, a, <coughs> it's a method that uh, we've been developing with uh, Shushan Mao uh, uh, here at MIT. And uh, <coughs> basically, what is a cross wavelength transform is the cross correlation of the wavelet transform of signal number one and signal number two, before and after the change. So here we have the wavelet transform of, uh, of signal X, that would be the blue curve, and the wavelet transform of the signal Y, that would be the red curve. Wavelet transform will give you a frequency time uh, analysis of your signal. So we'll have, uh, for each sample of your signal, you will have an information uh, for every frequency. And so we, you will have a, a 2D, uh, 2D space of information. Uh, with the frequency and the time here transform into a period and, and velocity. And so when you uh, do the cross correlation of those two wavelet transform, what you can get is the phase of this cross correlation is basically the phase difference between the two signal for every uh, sample of the signal and every frequency. And this phase divided by the frequency will give you this uh, uh, time shift uh, as a function of the frequency and the time. And so for this example, uh, at a particular distance uh, for the fundamental mode, I don't remember, uh, so at uh, nine kilometers, uh, we, uh, we can compute that. And so we can measure uh, a coherence between the two signals. That's very high uh, for most of the, the signal we see already in the time domain. We can measure along the uh, the period or the frequency and along the velocity or along the time, uh, a time shift between the, the two signals that are very small at 0 0.017. Uh, uh, and we see that along the different frequencies, this time shift is, is varying. It's negative at the beginning and it's uh, largely positive and, uh, and actually it's uh, varying like that. And so we are, uh, we are repeating that these measurements for uh, every day. Of, uh, of the record for every distance along this, uh, uh, this, uh, this stack and for each mode uh, separately. <coughs> no questions so far. So when we, when we do that after, we use this, uh, this formula of the linear regression along the distance. And this is uh, four examples uh, for the fundamental mode in red and uh, the first of the in blue. Uh, for uh, four days, four different days, where we did the, this linear regression uh, along the distance, and we see that uh, uh, the slope of this uh, this regression of the, the time shift versus distance is changing with the with the days, and this is for one particular frequency, but we can aggregate that the, these results for the fundamental mode and the first order tone for different frequencies in color and for the different days uh, uh, of the the records. So we see that for the fundamental mode, for example, for the first day we have a, a large spread uh, of variation, so it's uh, around uh, a point minus 0.2 percent of variation to plus 0.05 percent, and here it's minus 0.6 percent to plus 0.6 percent. So we have smaller variation for the fundamental mode, 
larger variation for the, uh, the first order tone. Uh, and we have a frequency dependent, uh, dependence uh, of, of this variation. So basically what, what we can think of each day and each record of each day is a, a relative um, dispersion curve uh, where we have a relative velocity variation as a function of the frequency. Aurélien? Yes. Your separation of the modes, uh, did you just have a cutoff distance because of uh, wave separation in time? Uh, so it's, so the, the separation in uh, uh, vertical separation, just the artificial shift that I, I put on the figure to just avoid the clutter of the figure. Otherwise it should be yeah. like center around zero. Uh, but the separation in distance is, uh, the first is to be further than three wavelengths, so to be in a far field. Uh, for so and and that gives you a, a distance of about four kilometers for the overtone, and about two kilometers for for the <coughs> the fundamental mode because they don't have exactly the same uh, frequency content. And the, the cutoff at the large distance is mostly uh, because of the signal to noise ratio at the uh, larger distance that was not that uh, that good. Okay. The fact that is it doesn't overlap is not uh, I mean it's coincidence. Okay. Mm. Can you explain this, these figures? I don't understand. There, it says velocity change, yes. but shouldn't it be reference to zero change at some time? Yeah, I mean, you're saying velocity change at the beginning of, of, of the beginning of the plot, which I'm thinking is the beginning of the experiment. Yeah, but the um, so the it's a relative velocity change uh, with respect to uh, uh, so the reference is just a stack over the whole amounts of data. Ah, okay. So it's over the mean. It's relative to the mean. Yeah, relative okay. to the, the mean variation. Okay, got it. So, so yeah, so the mean of that should be zero then. Yeah, the, the zero is over there. Yeah, okay. uh, so it's yeah, it's more or less okay. centered. Okay. And uh, you have the mean also here. So it's yeah. Centered. Okay. Thank you. So now that we have this uh, time dependence velo relative velocity variations, what we can do is. Uh, in invert them at depths. There is a, a linear relationship between the phase, relative phase velocity variation and the relative uh, shear wave velocity variation uh, versus depths. Uh, and we just uh, have to, uh, to compute this uh, kern sensitivity kernel with a, as, a frequency of, uh, as a function of frequency and depths. This is what they look like for the fundamental mode and the first of tone. And with this uh, this kernel, we just have to invert this, this expression to, to, uh, to obtain this uh, relative change of uh, shear wave velocity uh, versus depth. So we see that for the different kernels, so this is the, that tells you that for a certain depth and a certain frequency, where your surface wave will be uh, the most sensitive. Uh, and this is the uh, profile of the velocity model. See, for the fundamental model, we'll be sensitive mostly to uh, uh, the first 400, uh, 400 meters. But for the first overton, we have two or three blobs of uh, higher sensitivity in the near surface, uh, below this uh, higher velocity layer, and also in this uh, uh, cortasis uh, choke layer, where we have uh, at uh, low frequency, uh, relatively large sensitivity uh, from the first overton. So when we aggregate that together, uh, we see that this is basically uh, the sensitivity, the uh, aggregate sensitivity of the two, the two waves. And we see that we can add <coughs> information <coughs> to uh, basically uh, not two, two kilometers depth, but we have a, a non-zero sensitivity to a quite a, a large depth. So, these may be waves, right? Yeah. So, why, why you assume like a System the kernel only for SV because if, if you know the basic uh, model, you can actually get both. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, I didn't have access to the VP model directly. So, but yeah, you, you could build a more complicated kernel to have uh, both VP and VS. Uh, but that's for simplification, just uh, to have a, a very simple linear relationship between the, the two uh, two waves. But that that's true. You can you can build a, a more complicated sensitivity kernel. And in fact, for both P and, uh, yeah. and S wave uh, variations. And so we did that. And these are the, uh, the fit 
to uh, the relative uh, uh, or the yeah the relative velocity variation uh, as a function of frequency. So they are like dispersion curves. Uh, the model, uh, the data are the in blue and and, and signed for for the first uh, other tone and the fundamental model. And the fit to the data are those uh, those curves. And what we uh, what we get in the end is one D uh, velocity change with depth, shear wave velocity change with depth as a function of uh, the Julian day. And uh, what we see is that we don't have a lot of changes in a very near surface, but most of the changes are happening uh, in this deeper layer, uh, of the chalk, uh, uh, chalk layer, where we have uh, uh, not, real, uh, not so many changes in the first five days, and uh, a large decrease of about 2% uh, during the, the five uh, following days and a slow recovery of, uh, of velocity uh, for the following days. So when we put everything together, uh, both P wave, uh, refractive P wave, direct P wave, refractive P wave, and shear wave velocity uh, variations, uh, we see that uh, we start to have a, a, a homogeneous picture of what's happening. So we have uh, mainly large variation in this chalk layer because we see large variation for the <coughs> refractive P wave that's traveling in this layer, large variation for S wave velocity, small variation in the near surface from uh, direct P wave and from the direct, uh, like the fundamental mode and also the first order tone. And we have uh, also an anti-correlation between the variation of, uh, uh, of the shear wave, where we have a, a decrease of velocity and an increase, and uh, for the P wave, where we have increase and then a, a, a slow decrease of velocity. And we have also the uh, same kind of amplitude of variation, uh, more or less 1.5% uh, of variation. So what does it tell us in terms of uh, what's happening in the ground? Uh, to me, or maybe I'm, I'm not right on that, but I, I think the only way that you can uh, produce this kind of variation, anticorrelated between P wave and S wave, is by changing the saturation uh, of the ground. Now, so we did a, a very uh, quick analysis using a, a proelastic model, uh, and that's uh, just changing the, the saturation uh, of the model by uh, adding more of, uh, water than, uh, and replacing water, uh, uh, air by, by water. And you see that uh, this is the variation of uh, uh, P wave velocity uh, versus the saturation, the variation of the S wave velocity. Uh, and you see that they are anticorrelated only at high saturation. Otherwise, they would decrease uh, at low saturation both. And what we can uh, uh, know uh, we, if we make a bold assumption, I, I don't know. But Let's say that we uh, are actually, by luck, uh, in the saturation range where we are the most, where VP and VS are the most sensitive, uh, sensitive to, a, to a change. It would be around 70% of variation, where the slope of those two curves are, are the, the largest. And if we see that, uh, uh, if we center those, uh, those curves above, uh, uh, on the plus or minus 1.5% one one, one of variation, we see that it will give us a range of, uh, of saturation around 70%, that's gonna be a plus or minus 10% uh, of, of saturation. So this is a... Uh, is that brine compared to water, just water or? Uh, brine, is, yeah, it's water. It's You're replacing uh, brine, water with brine? No, uh, replacing uh, air by water. Oh, air, okay. Oh. Uh, otherwise, otherwise you'd, uh, you wouldn't see um, an increase of, uh, of of VP at high saturation. What's the permeability of that rock? Do you know? Uh, so here we had to make assumption that uh, I don't really know. We we put a I don't remember the number, but we put a twenty percent porosity uh, permeability. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't say that's yeah. It's we had to uh, assume <coughs> some stuff uh, just to be uh, kind of qualitative and see where uh, we have this uh, uh, opposite trend of, uh, of variation of the velocity. Uh, and this is the only, um, yeah, the only parameters that we, uh, we found that was, uh, was showing these uh, opposite trends. So I thought, I thought uh, 
water table of the body is pretty high, right? Yeah, the, wa the water table is, is very, yeah, very high. Yeah, it's shallow, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's really in the they, first uh, 50 meters. Like, uh, uh, actually, the, the water is at the surface because the ground is below sea, uh, sea yeah. level. <laughs> so, you, you, so no, it's still puzzling to see those deep changes and, and no changes there. Uh, I I have so no you, clear. You, you want to fluctuate like twenty percent of the saturation, on several hundred below the water table. Yep. Yeah, but I I'm, I think this uh, layer and other layer in the, in the near surface are are, are really uh, confining the water table. Is there any like uh, like impermeable layer in between? I think this uh, this layer at the top of the chalk is uh, almost impermeable. But there are also like uh, clay lenses uh, yeah, everywhere because they are, they are water table at different depths but they don't really communicate if uh, I remember my uh, my readings on the, on the subject. What's going on with the poroelastic model? The D-wave speed increases beyond 50% saturation? Is that... Yes. Why does it go down and then go up? The VP, uh, like the as a So if you have only air in the um, in the pores and you uh, add a little bit of water, uh, I think you're changing the density more, oh, and so you okay. decrease the VP. But when you uh, go above fifty percent of uh, of water, you you get more and more sensitive to the the wave speed in in water. I mean. So you have an increase of uh, of VB. The so whole time it's just zero shear resistance. Yeah, so and and shear wave only only decrease. Okay. So the shear wave decreases density due to the density, I guess. Is that again, is that right? Uh, to the density. Yeah, yeah. 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 The first order shear waves yeah, don't, yeah. don't care about fluid. Yeah. Right. So you don't include the proper in the model. No. That's. Yeah, no, that's definitely something that can vary as well. But the pore pressure will... The pore pressure variation won't uh, change the trend. Because I remember like, if you include the pore pressure changes and density changes, then yeah, you can have pore pressure is usually like, twice larger effect than yeah, density yeah. effect. So your curve is also... But you, you won't... Uh, if you increase the pore pressure, you won't increase the p wave velocity. Yeah, there I, I was actually thinking that the density curve is opposite and uh, go back down by the population. Mm -hmm. You will density increase by the this way. Yeah. Oh yeah, you you're right. There is a yeah. there is a, a time uh, a saturation ratio where the pore pressure if if pore pressure is varying as well. Uh, takes over the saturation of the sensor. Mm -hmm. I that, that was a very simple modeling and we can definitely dig further into that. How, how consolidated is this material in your, in your like mental emissions? Is it uh, so basically it's, cho hard? it's chalk, it's the same kind of chalk as you have in uh, the cliffs in England. and uh, okay. So it's pretty porous, but you also have some very hard layer of um, mm -hmm. What do you call this work? Um, like the silicates work. I don't know the name in English. The what is it in French? Uh, silex. Silex? Yeah, in chalk. Yeah. So and so that's 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 pretty hard. But you can also uh, you can also have like some um, uh, karstic uh, dissolution also in this in this chalk, and that would make the the permeability also very. Uh, very high, but we don't really know what's happening in this chalk layer. What kind of year is this? Uh, that was in uh, February, March. So is there any chance they could be losing, have, have a casing hole or something that's leaking gas into the formation at that? I'm just trying to think of how you get, how you get rid of, or how you go from low saturation to higher saturation. When you get a, if you got a leak in a, in a production well, yeah, uh, I don't know where the whales are, if, uh, if there was yeah. whales close to the area. Well, actually, there is a close to the possible. 
hot tub then? Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, we are solo person back to the map. <coughs> You yeah, just want one person is here. Yeah, that's how they end the block, right? And yeah, yeah. No, but uh, no, that's some information that uh, I didn't get. But you wanted just one area. Yeah, yeah this, this, this data, the data that I'm showing you, is yeah. from from this uh, this patch and from one month, and we have like four other uh, patches. Is there any geodetic? Uh, there must be geodetic data. I'm looking at a point or substance there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I wonder if there's any changes or anything in that genetic data that would correlate with this. I yeah. think they monitored ge that pretty well, Brad. Yeah, yeah, um, probably. Or took that data. Yeah, that's what I So, almost done. I was uh, just one slide from the end, so. Thank <laughs> 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 you. It was just the conclusion. So, yeah, we. Uh, we use this novel approach of using ballistic waves instead of coda wave to uh, monitor the velocity variation in, in the ground. Uh, we need to use a pretty dense network to uh, get rid of this uh, noise sources variation to stack on, on different azimuths. We developed this uh, cross weighted transform to, uh, to measure this uh, time frequency dependent, uh, uh, frequency dependent time shift uh, along the surface wave and, and uh, <coughs> and we measured the yeah the variation not directly along the the travel time but along the travel time and distance and to have this uh, change of slope that allows us to have a, a pretty fine uh, accuracy even for body waves and uh, the result that we get from both combination of uh, combination of both p wave and s wave uh, shows that uh, uh, we have some uh, we can have some uh, hydrological constraint on uh, what's happening at, at, uh, at depths from uh, just listening to the sound of the waves crashing in the oceans. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you want to know more about seismic noise, <laughs> <laughs> Nori uh, wrote a nice book with uh, Lucia Gualteri and uh, Andreas Fickner, and uh, it's available in all good bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> if you can find Very interesting talk. Any further questions and comments? Yeah, I was just curious about the uh, derivation of the phase from the wavelet transform uh, to continuous wavelet transform. And as you know, when, when you fuse a different mother wavelet, sometimes some results are different. Have you looked at yep. the effect of choosing a different mother? Does it change the phase? Uh, it doesn't re change the phase. It smears more or less the information with frequency or with time. Yeah. So uh, we use the um, Morley wavelet, which is the most compact in uh, time and frequency. But we we try with uh, Morse wavelet and other other wavelet. But it's less uh, Morley wavelet performs better for for this kind of signals. It has the, the yeah the, the best separation and the best trade-off between frequency resolution and, and time resolution. Other questions? In the, the Schmiel 2019 tomography, noise tomography, mm. was that done with two modes? Uh, no, um, so we did uh, only relay and low wave fundamental mode, and we picked the, the overtone only for the average dispersion curve. And so we, we use this average uh, overtone dispersion curve to constrain also the inversion, but we didn't pick the, the dispersion curve locally for each correlation. So basically, we use this uh, FK, uh, this FK plot to pick the phase velocity uh, dispersion curve of the fundamental mode and the overtone, but we only locally invert for the group velocity of relay and the wave for the fundamental mode. So what was the decision to decide on averaging the fundamental versus the overtone? Is it based on the sensitivities where you think you can? No, it's just uh, to uh, to make the dispersion curve picking easier. Uh, it's still my problem, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, it's, uh, we, we didn't really, we were not very able to pick the, the overtone uh, accurately for the group velocity, and so we we decided that we wanted still this information, but we kept only the, the average information as a one-point control 
uh, but yeah, no, no local information. But that's still uh, constraining the inversion pretty well. Okay. Just one thing. There is uh, yeah, no, yeah. Just uh, what uh, I mean. Uh, how, how promising do you think, like you know, push like from one D sub, you know, DBOB to like two D because you have this kind of very dense kind of arrays. I mean, because you have this kind of maybe array uh, seismology being used, right? Yep. I mean, how how do you think? Uh, I think the the biggest problem will be to uh, to assess this noise sources variation and to correct for them. So so far, I don't know if we have a. Uh, Beside doing full waveform inversion and joint inversion of the noise sources distribution and, and completely modeling the, the waveforms due to those uh, noise sources, uh, that is the ultimate solution. Yes, I, I think it's a, simple, simple, a more simple question is that. What if you divide your whole like this array into like? Yeah, you can you can start to to play uh, like that to start to regionalize your your variation. Uh, that would be a, a first step approach, or to look at variation that are supposedly not corrected with the noise sources variation, like not no variation like seasonal variation or uh, if you if you look at much longer time period variation, maybe you can just decipher between the seasonal variation and what's actually uh, happening in the ground, or much shorter period variation. So why that the uh, stack can overcome the noise variation? Uh, it's basically because uh, you the, no the noise variation is basically when the noise sources are shifting in azimuths. That, that will produce a, a, a travel time change, uh, apparent travel time change. So if you stack over all the azimuths, you, you just kill this azimuthal information. So for example, like if you have like a slow, like if, if one D is completely correct, that's fine, but B stack is like, we don't need to hold the one D assumption. Mm. Uh, if one way is faster than the other way, and noise actually moves, and then eventually you are super gather becomes slower because of noise variation. Yep. And uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, <laughs> I think for for this particular experiment, it's uh, it's it was a fair assumption to just stack everything because the model <coughs> is is very close to be uh, to be one D, but uh, on other kind of configuration is. Uh, yeah, you have to you have to be careful. Okay. But yeah, that's the first step. Other questions? No? Let's thank our, our speaker again. Okay.